Okay, well, uh, I'm Professor O'Rourke. Uh, I'm going to be using this uh, set of notes from a, uh, a document that purports to uh, be a study guide for the FE exam. We're going to be talking about steel design. Um, and the first thing is I guess we need to d describe what steel beams are. They have flanges that are characterized by the width and the thickness of the flange. The little, uh, subscript F indicates that it is a, uh, a flange property. Uh, the web has a subscript W, uh, and the flexural um, capacity is given, uh, the nominal flexural capacity is given by <clears throat> the yield stress times the plastic section modulus. The plastic section modulus is essentially areas times lever arms and it is usually available in tables. We'll see one such table in a little bit. Um, and then the safety of the uh, steel beam in flexure is given by making sure that the factored moment and the load factors are 1.6 for uh, live and 1.2 for dead. So 1.6 live, 1.2 dead has to be less than, that is the demand, has to be less than an underestimation of the capacity. So we, we have the, uh, an overestimation of the loads and an underestimation of the capacity. Um, the uh, procedures where we're using the plastic section modulus down here on the bottom uh, uh, envisions yielding of the shape um, for regular bending, positive bending. The top is in compression, the bottom is in tension, and we're assuming that um, at the plastic neutral axis, everything above the plastic neutral axis has the, is at the yield stress in tension or in compression, and everything below the plastic neutral axis is at yield. Uh, in tension. Uh, and so in order to have things act in compression at yield, they need to be stocky enough to avoid local buckler. And there are two requirements in the, the term that is used to characterize something where it can get up to yield before it suffers local buckling. The term is the compact section and there is a compact section requirement for the flanges. These need to be stocky enough so that they will yield before they suffer local buckling. Similarly, the web needs to be stocky enough. H over T has to be less than something uh, so in order for that element to yield before it uh, suffers local buckling. So, and these, the uh, limiting criteria for compactness is related to something over the square root of F sub Y. Uh, for those that have taken steel design, they know why it's the square root of F sub Y, but uh, we'll leave that uh, for another time. And so if we can have an example, um, establish whether a W21 by 55 A992 steel, um, did you? Take steel design? No. Okay. Um, steel design is something that is relatively difficult to learn on the fly. Um, so, and I envision this as a refresher for people that have already taken the steel design class. Um, I don't think any of you have taken the steel design class, so um, the effectiveness of this might be uh, somewhat limited. Anyway, the, the example in the notes is established whether a W21 by 55, a W21 is nominally 21 inches deep. So the D for a W21 
is not, <clears throat> excuse me, nominally 21 inches, and it weighs about 55 uh, pounds, <coughs> excuse me, pounds per uh, foot of length. And there are then a table where information is available. And for the W21 by 55, we have the overall depth is 20.8 inches, close to 21. The thickness of the web is uh, 3 eighths of an inch, 0.375. And the flange, 8 inches plus 8 and a quarter wide, more or less, and about uh, a half inch thick. So the idea then is if this thing is compact um, and the yield stress for A992 steel is 50 KSI, and so we plug in 50 KSI into each of these formulas and see if the web and the um, uh, flange are compact, that is they're stocky enough. So the, the slenderness of the flange is the width divided by two times the thickness. This actually should be the f half the flange width is divided by the flange thickness because the um, okay, I can write on the side here. And so for the This portion here could buckle up or down when it's subjected to compression, and so the this is D sub F over 2, and this is the thickness, T sub F. So B sub F over 2 divided by T sub F is the slenderness for that particular element. Um, and uh, so it's 8 and a quarter inches divided by 2 times the flange thickness of about half inch, that's 0 .78. Uh, the limit, 64 uh, divided by the square root of F sub Y, F sub Y is 50 KSI, kips per square inch, that gives 9. This is less than 9, less than the, the limit, and so it's okay in terms of the flange. In terms of the web, the H dimension is this one here. So it's the overall depth uh, minus two flange thicknesses divided by the thickness of the web. And so what we're wanting to avoid is buckling of the web in a fashion like that, some lateral buckling. Um, so H over T sub W, the overall depth about 21 inches, take away an inch for the top and bottom flange, divided by the thickness 3 eighths, we get 52. Uh, the formula is more or less uh, 10 times this number up here, that is uh, as opposed to 64.7, it's 640 divided by the square root of F sub Y, so it's about 10 times this, about 90. This is stockier, the H is small, the width is big enough so that it fits under the criteria. Both the flange and the web are, satisfy the criteria and therefore they are compact. Um, the other uh, potential failure mechanism for a steel beam is called lateral torsional buckling and the for a uh, the lateral torsional buckling involves the primarily the compression flange moving laterally and the whole thing rotating. The torsion is the rotation. That is the, uh, this thing has rotated, you know, a certain number of degrees. It also has moved laterally, lateral torsional buckling. The, um, there is a graph which shows the
um, allowable flexural stress. That's this graph over here. As the unbraced length of the compression flange gets bigger and bigger, the allowable buck or bending stress gets smaller and smaller. Uh, and there are three regions identified by um, unbraced lengths less than LP, unbraced lengths between LP and LR, and unbraced lengths larger than L sub R. Uh, and there are formulas for each of these three regions. Um, and the, there are also formulas for what L sub P is and what L sub R is. These are the formulas for those two quantities. Uh, kind of complicated. Uh, the good news is that the AISC steel manual as well as information that's um, uh, in the past has been provided to people. Um, this is a, a ver you can bring some stuff with you. Um, this one has the quantities identified. Uh, eventually we're going to get to a problem with the W21 by 48. That's 21 inches deep, 48 pounds per foot. And the L sub P value is 6.1 and the L sub R value is 16.6. So depending on how, what's the distance between lateral bracing points, and the lateral bracing points for a, a bridge girder, something that you may have seen, There is often, to, well, there's a deck up at the top, and underneath there is bracing like this, which prevents the flanges from moving with respect to one another. And so this would be the bracing for a bridge girder. Um, it, for a beam, uh, there's other, uh, a regular beam in a building, uh, there's other ways of getting it. But anyway, there are formulas then for the two limits on the moment versus unbraced length graph. Um, an example, we have here a, um, a W21 by 48 beam, A992 steel, which means that F sub Y is equal to 50 KSI. Has a compression flange brace at six feet intervals, assuming the beam is compact. If it's compact, that means it's controlled by yielding as opposed to local buckling or lateral torsional buckling. So what is most nearly the available plastic moment capacity of the beam? Uh, so we know what the uh, beam is. And we can look up in our table what the Z, the plastic section modulus, is for this uh, W21 by 48. That's shown here. W21 by 48, uh, Z sub X is 107 inches cubed. And so we could use in the formula the um, nominal or the design capacity. So the design capacity in bending is the phi factor, it happens to be 0.9 for bending, yield stress F sub Y 50 KSI, Z sub X the section modulus uh, divided by 12 inches per foot, so that turns out to be 401 kip feet and that's closest to uh, 400 kip feet, so the answer is B. Um, there are modification factors, the C sub B factor, where the moment is not uniform between the unbraced lengths. For example, um, if you have a 
beam, simply supported beam with two loads P on it, it turns out that the bending moment for this And if there is lateral bracing at that load point and lateral bracing, these in steel design are known as the magic fingers or the magic hands. They provide lateral bracing. That means the beam can't move or can't rotate at that point. It can in between these two spots. But not, whoops, can everybody see? Yeah, everybody can see that. Uh, and so in this particular case, M of X, the bending moment diagram, um, has everybody taken strength of materials? Yes? Yeah. Okay. So anyway, uh, this shape of the moment diagram shouldn't, shouldn't surprise you too much. Anyway, this is a region where the, the bending moment is uniformly increasing. This is a region where it's constant. And this is where it is also changing. Um, and the C sub B factor of 1 is, or the, that is the formulas, are based on a uniform moment between the braced points. And these have C sub B greater than 1, which means that it's high moment at part of the region and low moment somewhere else. And there is a table kindly provided in this a set of notes um, for this particular case that we've had if the bracing points and in order to uh, find, uh, see what's going on here there are is an X which indicates where the brace points are and so what I just drawn is one where there is Bracing at the end, let me put that magic finger in, there, and there's one over there, and so there's three regions of the beam, something between those two points, something between those, and something there, and the for this two-point loads, um, the region where the load or the moment is increasing uniformly, 1.67 is the C sub B. In the region where the uh, moment is uniform, 1.0 C sub B and 1.67 over here. If the only thing is bracing at the ends, which means this one is out and this one is out, the unbraced length is bigger and for uh, so it goes from here all the way over to here. There's some places where it's uniform, some places where it's not. The, for that, then we no longer have this. We no longer have that. But for this, all of this, the C sub B is equal to 1.14. Because from the table, Two-point loads, bracing, there is an X, there is an X, no X there, no X there, 1.14. Questions about any of this? Okay. Um, okay. And uh, we talked about this table already. It, we used Z sub X. Um, I believe later on we're going to use some of the other parameters. Um, oh, and uh, so the, there are formulas then for what the moment is in the region up here at the top. Um, that's, um, this is uh, MN is equal to phi, oh, mn doesn't have the phi. It's equal to uh, f sub y times uh, z sub uh, x. So that 
is the formula in that region. And the other two regions, we have complicated formulas representing the decrease in moment with an increase in unbraced length. Um, and then when we're in this region here, um, we have the, the variation of moment is shown there. Uh, as an example, a W21 by 68, <coughs> be 32 feet long, A992 steel, A992 has F sub Y equals 50 KSI. Oh, it says it right after, which has a yield strength of 50 KSI. The compression flange is braced at the ends and at intervals of 8 feet. C sub B is equal to 1. The plastic moment capacity is uh, 600 kip feet. Uh, L sub P is uh, 6.4 feet. Um, the, oh, and uh, L sub R is 18.7. So the uh, unbraced length is in this, this value right here is 6.4. This is 18.7. So it's pretty close to the value up at the top. Um, the service load is uh, six. Uh, I'm sorry, 256. Due to uniform live load, um, a point load gives uh, an additional moment of 80 kip feet, um, and 8.7 uh, kips kip feet moment due to the self weight. What is most nearly the available moment? Um, strength and is the beam adequate. Uh, so the first thing we have to do is figure out what the, the factor moment is. M sub u, all of the live loads times 1.6, all of the um, dead loads by 1.2, so 1.6 times the uniform plus concentrated live, 1.2 times the self weight, that's 548 from the table, um, we have a W21 by 60, I think there's another table here, isn't there? Okay, this is the table they're talking about. The W21 by 68 is further up in the table. And uh, the, uh, the section modulus, or the Z, Oh, the section modulus X, S, sub X is 140. And so applying the formula, um, which is the formula for the region, this region right here between LP and LR, our length uh, 6.4 is, I'm sorry, 8 feet is greater than 6.4 and less than 18, so it's in this region somewhere. And this is the formula that then applies where LP is, uh, LB is larger than LP but less than L sub R. And so we need to evaluate that formula. These are all the parts of it. MP is that. MP minus a phi factor times 0.7, FY times SX, and then LB minus LP over LR minus LP. It's about 567. That's less than 600, uh, which, oh, and the P factor is 0.9. And so the correct answer is D. It's about, it's close to 570, and since that capacity is larger than the demand, which is 548, the beam is adequate. And so the correct answer is D. Um, questions? Okay. Uh, there are shear forces in the beam, and there are formulas for what the shear capacity of the beam is. Um, and the, the 
the formula without the phi factor is 0.6 Fy times D times T sub W. Um, and uh, it's possible that the web can buckle, in, oh, this involves uh, yielding of the beam in shear. It's possible to have shear buckling. And then we have another formula, H over T sub W. Um, if H over T sub W is small enough, that is, if the web is stocky enough, we get yielding as opposed to local buckling. Um, if, on the other hand, the web is um, between these other two limits, there is a reduction factor that applies. Um, and if it's uh, greater than the, the top limit, um, a different reduction factor applies. So we are now moving to a discussion of columns. And the basic, uh, one of the basic parameters in the column is the Euler buckling formula. Pi squared EI over L squared. That's for a uh, pin pinned beam of length L. Um, the um, AISC formula has the same general form, um, except now uh, the, the uh, uh, area here is, uh, well, the this divided by the area is uh, pi squared E over K over R quantity squared. Uh, R is the radius of gyration for the section. And then the allowable stress is pi squared E K L over R quantity squared. The K is the so-called effective length factor. And the effective length factor for uh, some simple boundary conditions are shown here. Uh, if it is pinned at the top and pinned at the bottom, the theoretical value is effective length of 1, and the recommended design value is 1. Built in at both ends, the um, theoretical effective length is 0.5. The recommended value is 0.65. That's because it's uh, most bo most boundary conditions will result in something that's rotationally stiffer than what we are envisioning here. Even if you built it in, um, there isn't as much rotational stiffness for this. That is, there is more rotational stiffness in actuality than this is. Envision, there is less when this is envisioned, um, which means that the effective length factor has to get a little bit bigger. These three at the top, um, there is a nomograph which can be used. The, the critical thing is that the top has not displaced with respect to the base. And so the top hasn't moved, the bottom hasn't moved. And all of the effective length factors are between 0.5 and 1.0. Another situation is the top of the column moves with respect to the bottom of the column. There are um, two types of um, uh, buildings in general. One is a so-called unbraced frame, and the lateral resistance is due to uh, is a result of the be uh, the building moving sideways. So these are all unbraced frames where the top of the building moves well. The t this floor moves with respect to the floor down below. And then there are braced frames.
where we have columns, we have beams, and we have bracing. And so if the load is applied here, it ends up being over here. If the load is applied here, it ends up being there. This one will buckle like that, whereas this one buckles with what is called side sway. So this is a braced frame. <clears throat> and the all of these on the bottom are unbraced frames because the top moves with respect to the bottom. All of these are braced frames because the top does not move with respect to the bottom. Uh, okay. Uh, there is, and uh, KL over R is known as the slenderness ratio. Um, and it is a, uh, it characterizes how uh, skinny the uh, member is when subjected to compression. An example, we have a uh, 3,400 pound sign supported by three equally spaced cables that refer to these three cables here. Um, and from a W10 by 39 beam, the beam in turn is supported by two side wires. Now this is a plan view looking down on it from above in a helicopter. So these are the side wires. Um, and then there is a threaded rod uh, which provides tensile support. Um, and the question is, uh, what is most nearly the slenderness ratio for the W10 beam? So what is KL over R for this beam? Um, it says, assume all beam, wire, and rod connections are pinned. It shows it being built in. But the problem says, assume that it is a pin. So we have a pin right here. And we have a pin over here. And using the little graph, that corresponds to this condition of pin at both ends. The uh, K value is 1. The length is the distance. Uh, the total length is what? 20 feet. We have 4 feet here. And so from here to here, the distance is um, 16 feet. So the effective length factor is 1. The length is 16 feet. We have to convert feet into inches. The R for our beam, which is a W10 by 39, um, the W10 by 39 is down here, and the RX is um, 4.27 from the table, and, whoops, the, oh, it's going to... The buckling would be about the weak axis, and so it would, in this particular case, it, um, uh, the, the R that we want is 1.98. That is if it's going to buckle, it will buckle in plan.
so it will buckle about the y-axis or the weak axis, that is the, the beam. Uh, this axis is the x and the vertical axis is the y. And so it's going to buckle by moving like that. And if it buckled like this, that would be buckling about the x-axis. And so the, it's, uh, since Ry is less than Rx, it's going to buckle like this or like that, as opposed to buckling up and down. So KL over R, effective length factor, uh, length of 16 feet, converting that into inches divided by 2 inches, it's 96. And so the answer the most nearly, uh, what is most nearly the slenderness ratio, C is 97. Questions? Okay. Um, Oh, and there are then formulas for um, the, the uh, compressive capacity, the compressive strength, the critical stress um, in columns. It's a function of the slenderness. One formula applies if the slenderness is low. The other formula applies if the slenderness is large. And it kind of looks like this here. And the magic, the boundary between them, 4.7 E over F sub Y in terms of the slenderness. Oh, um, and there are tables of, that are relatively easy to use. It's the effective length with respect to the uh, uh, least radius of gyration, R sub y. So this is an effective length, KL. And then for different columns, you can figure out what the capacity is. Uh, so if we have a W10 by 39, which is right there, and the effective length was 16 feet, then that um, column is good for 260 kips. So in the problem we just looked at, I didn't ask for it. I didn't ask for it, but if this load here is less than, um, what was the magic number? 260? Two sixty, yeah. If this load is less than two hundred and sixty, it's okay. The, uh, there are tension members, I, I particularly when I teach steel design, I start with tension members because they're the easiest. Um, this uh, practice document started with bending and then went to columns and now is going to tension members. Um, not the 
the way I would organize it, but I'm not the author. So we have um, <clears throat> a, a gross area and net area that has to be accounted for. The gross area is the width times the thickness, and net areas is because oftentimes in steel we drill a hole so that we have a, place, uh, a spot to bolt some things together. So it could be, for instance, if the load is to the left, um, the crack would occur right here, and we have some area out due to the bolt holes. And so the crosshatch places here is the net area. Um, and the, the size of the hole uh, is usually taken to be a sixteenth larger than the diameter of the connector. That is, you need some space to put the bolt into the hole. If it was, you know, if, it, if it's a half inch and the bolt is a half inch, it'd be difficult. It's possible if things are a little bit off uh, for the bolt not to fit in. The sixteenth accounts for that. There is another sixteenth that uh, is assumed to be lost because the uh, process of making the hole uh, uh, damages some of the material around the perimeter of the hole. And so there's another sixteenth added for that. So if you know the diameter of the hole, you add a sixteenth. If you know the diameter of the bolt, you add a sixteenth to get the diameter of the hole, and then you add another sixteenth to get the effective diameter. And so the D, the effective diameter, is either the hole diameter plus a sixteenth, or the fastener diameter plus an eighth. So we could then have a, a flat steel bar tension member has a yield stress of 50 KSI and an alderman of 60. Two, uh, holes for the bolted connection are punched at the end of the member. The effective hole diameter is one inch. So that's D sub H is one inch. It's, uh, it's what, 15 sixteenths uh, diameter connector. And the question then is, um, No, oh, it's given up here. Um, the net tensile area is most nearly what? It's eight inches uh, in width, a half inch in thickness, and we have two holes out. And so the area is the thickness, which is a half inch, minus the width that started out, um, which is eight inches. You subtract away two holes, the hole diameter plus a sixteenth, and that comes to 2.94. That's close to three, and so the answer is three square inches. Questions? Okay. Okay. So the uh, calculation um, for um, tension members is if it is um, for yielding, the, the fee factor is 0.9, and for fracture, the fee factor is 0.75. Um, for example, and that's I should have indicated, let's see. Uh, no, I'm not going to do that example because it has S squared over 4G, which hasn't been discussed. Okay. Uh, the last item 
except for some example problems, is um, beam columns. These are arguably the most complicated things that um, an undergraduate uh, structural engineer encounters because uh, they, you have to look at it as a beam and some capacity is used up by the bending of the, um, oh, let me get this out of the way so it looks better. Some of the capacity is used up as a column and some capacity is used up as a beam. And we have to add those two things together. The way that AISC has done it is to take a ratio of the, um, uh, the, the demand divided by the capacity for the column, demand divided by capacity for the beam, and making sure that both of those things with the factor 8 ninths applied to the beam part for low or for large axial loads. For low axial loads, there's a factor of 1 over 2 applied to the collar. And so the, the beam portion plus the column portion needs to be less than 1. And the portions are the demand, what the thing needs to carry, and the capacity uh, for carrying that load. Um, the, uh, unfortunately, the example here uh, that is given is one where it doesn't say um, what the KL is equal to um, and what, so, um, and it doesn't say what the unbraced length is. So this is, I didn't think, such a good example. Um, because it doesn't, so it doesn't say where you got this and where you got that value. It's using the correct formulas, but it doesn't tell you where you get some of these things. In this, the problem statement, it says that the um, required axial strength is 170 kips, so that's good. The moment is uh, uh, 22.8, but it doesn't say where you get the 504 and where you get the 184. So I didn't particularly like that problem. Um, no, again, I'm not the author of the, this document. If I did it, hopefully I would have checked my answers and did a little better job, but that's okay. Uh, the other thing that we want to uh, consider for beam columns is the second order effects. Uh, this has to do with what is known as P delta moments. Let's say you have a um, column that's built in at the bottom and you have a axial load and you have a bending moment P and M. So the problem with this is that the axial load, well the moment and the axial load will result in this thing deflecting over here and so the actual axial load is applied there, the actual moment is applied there, and at the bottom we have an axial load P, this moment, let's call it M0, plus P times whatever the delta is, the deflection. So not only do we have a um, axial load and a moment, which we have to consider separately, but the fact that 
there is deflection here means that there is an additional bending moment due to what are called P delta effects. This P times that delta is this additional moment because the beam has deflected. You get the same thing. Oh, uh, this you could get, for example, So a gas station with one of these signs, the weight is here, that will cause an axial load and a bending moment on the top of that column. And the column is subjected then to not only the applied loads, but P delta moments which result from this thing displacing. The way that that is handled in uh, AISC is to amplify the um, moments. And the amplification factor is C sub B, which uh, can be taken as 1 in most cases, times 1 minus the applied load over the Euler buckling load. An example, for example, or as an example, steel W14 by 132. Uh, 50 KSI steel, uh, live load of 200 kips, a moment of 250 kip heat around the strong axis causes lateral, caused by lateral loading. Unsupported length is 20 feet, K is equal to 1, the moment of inertia is 1530. The um, X axis, the strong axis, the structural magnifier for the beam is nearly equal to what? It is Chi squared EI over quant uh, KL quantity squared, um, which goes down there. And then the axial load of 200 goes up there. The Euler buckling load, pi squared E, the modulus elasticity for steel is 29,000 KSI. The moment of inertia is 1530. Um, the Effective length factor is 1. It's 20 feet converted into inches. That's 1,700 kips compared to 200 kips. And so this uh, amplification factor isn't very big. No, the... Um, Required strength, it's live load, so 1.6 times 200 is 320. That divided by uh, uh, 7,600 is a small number, and so 1.04 is relatively close to 1. Here, the P delta moment isn't very big. Okay. We are in the we're rounding the final turn and heading for home. So there's two problems on this page which we're going to do, and then two problems on the next. Yeah. Okay, so the first... Problem. A 25 foot long beam is loaded uniformly in live load 4 kips per foot. Loading due to self weight is negligible. There is adequate lateral support provided to the beam. Uh, the required plastic section modulus for a W12 shape using A50 or for grade 50 steel is most nearly. Well, first of all, we have to figure out what the moment is. Uh, 1.6 times the live load. The live load is 4 kips per foot. The bending moment formula is WL squared over 8 for a uniform load. Um, the span is uh, 25 feet. We get about 500 kip feet. Uh, the plastic moment capacity is that divided by the fee factor. Um, and the, so the plastic section modulus, if you look at the formulas, is then the plastic moment that we need uh, divided by 
uh, the V factor times the yield stress. So 499, 12 inches per foot, a V factor of 0.9, 50 KSI, it's 130. 130 is closest to, well, 133 is closest to 130. And so that's, uh, the answer is D. Um, questions? Uh, an I-shaped beam is built uh, with a 0.3 inch thick plates. The material yield is 50 KSI. If the height of the web is 18 inches, the available shear stress is almost nearly. Um, so that is this one right here. We need to figure out the area of the steel uh, web. Area of the web is the thickness of the web times the overall depth uh, plus two flange thicknesses. 18 inches plus two times 0.3, which is the thickness of the flanges. Again, the a little sketch here. The so I will do it here. This is. 0.3 inches, this is 0.3 inches, the H is 18 inches, uh, and so that's um, whatever it is, uh, so that's the overall depth of the member, 18.6 inches, uh, the uh, thickness of, oh, it's, it's made of plates, and so this web thickness is 0.3 inches also. And so this, so this three inches is the web thickness. This is the flange thickness. And so we get an area about uh, 5.6 inches square. The formulas that we had before for shear are shown here. Um, the, uh, and so the magic number is 418 over the square root of F sub Y. 418 over the square root of F sub Y is 59.1. H over T, 18 divided by 0.3, and this is the web thickness. That's 60. Um, and so the... Um, this is real close to the boundary. The boundary is a phi factor times 0.6 Fy times the uh, shear area. And all of this is um, uh, 149 kips. This is 0.98. Um, and so the answer is uh, 148, that's close to 150. Okay. And then for the columns, uh, we have, we're only going to do this one here and this one here, one and three. So and one, a steel compression member has a fixed support at one end and a frictionless ball support, that is a pin, at the other, up at the top. The total applied design load consists of dead of seven plus the weight of the member and an unspecified live load. 
design, not theoretical effective length factors are to be used. This compression member is controlled by uh, local buckling, inelastic buckling, elastic buckling, and torsion. In order to understand this question, we have to identify on the diagram for the compression. It's the column one. So for the columns, the magic number is 4.7. E over F sub Y, that's the slenderness. And if we are less than that, that is called inelastic buckling. Greater, it's elastic buckling. So this is the, the column behavior is identified here. We need to figure out then um, in problem number one. Um, no, the effective length factor for design um, for both axes is 0.8. That's the effective length factor that we discussed. The recommended value for a pin at one end and uh, built in at the other. So the effective length factor is 0.8. One end pin, the other end built in. The recommended value for design is 0.8. Uh, we're almost done, but you can have one of these if you want. Thank you. You're welcome. Um, So this, uh, the radius of generation is the square root of the moment of inertia divided by the area. Um, in this problem statement, um, um, Ix is 533, area is 19.1. From strength of materials, the radius of gyration, Rx, uh, is Ix over A square root. So the slenderness ratio KL over R, uh, 10 feet, which is 120 inches. Effective length factor is 0.8. The radius of gyration is 5.3. So that gives a slenderness ratio of uh, 18. For the y-axis, Iy over A is 3. 3 plugging in the same formula gets 31. The larger of the slenderness ratios, which you probably could have guessed, uh, is going to be the y-axis. So we have 31. The magic formula, 4.7, the square root of E over F sub Y, 113. And so we are on that curve. We are below um, the magic threshold. Magic threshold, 4.7, the square root of E over F sub Y. 4.7 square root of E over F sub Y. We are below that, so that is in the inelastic buckling portion. The answer is C. Now, the last review question. A solid steel column with a fixed bottom and pin at the top um, is concentrically loaded. The material properties are shown. It's a 6 by 9. Yield stress 50 KSI. Modulus elasticity uh, uh, 29,000 uh, uh, PSI. Uh, this should be 29 million KSI. This is, sorry. This is K, Kip's The available compressive strength is most nearly 
Uh, we need to figure out the slenderness and then from a table figure out what the, the, uh, yield, comp uh, the yield stress is. And so the solution, oops, on this one, the weak axis, the radius of generation squared by the area, um, the uh, formula for the moment of inertia of a rectangle, 112 bh cubed. The area is B times H, so the uh, weak axis, oh, the radius gyration is 1.47, I'm sorry, 1.7. Slenderness, um, 2.1, the effective length factor, span of 9 feet converting into inches divided by 1.7 is 130, and then there is a table in the columns portion. So this is for 50 KSI. The slenderness is 130, and so the phi C sub R is about 13.2. Uh, oh, I wonder if they interpolated. This is about 30, I'm sorry, 131, 13.2. Um, and that's close to 13 KSI. So, I think this would have been more familiar if you had already taken steel design. But uh, anyway, question? Okay. Well, I all wish you the best of luck. Um, if there's anybody that has a friend that would like a copy of these notes, I have them here for anybody. Uh, but otherwise, I wish you luck and we'll see you on campus.